Hello, everyone. I'm George Porfiris. I'm an eMERGE doc for Michael Guerin Hospital, and I'm happy to be here to give you this talk on blood and guts, an update on GI emergencies. I have uh, no disclosures. And the objectives of this talk are twofold. First is to go over new articles that discuss what's new in the world of GI emergencies. And second is to challenge the status quo, uh, going over the evidence of how we treat appendicitis and diverticulitis, small bowel obstruction, uh, seeing if there's actually evidence behind what we're doing right now and seeing if there's anything else that maybe we should be doing instead. Let's start off with this uh, nice small study. Uh, as you all know, nausea and vomiting is a very common complaint that we see in the emergency department. And now our, all our emergency departments are overburdened. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of these patients sit out in triage for, for many hours with no treatment. So what they did was they, they tried giving alcohol wipes. So just isopropyl alcohol wipes, the stuff that you have hanging around your department to patients whose chief complaint was nausea and vomiting. Um, and they asked them to sniff it for up to 60 seconds. And they found that within two minutes, there actually there was an effect, and, and which peaked around 10 minutes uh, and showed a large difference uh, between the scores that patients uh, reported for nausea and vomiting um, when they were given the alcohol wipes versus placebo. So this is one of these sort of why not studies. There's really no downside to this. There's really no side effects to this. Uh, it's a very common condition. It can be easily implemented. Um, so I think this is something that we should be doing and we should probably put this in an order set and have, you know, if, when, when somebody comes to the triage with nausea and vomiting, just go ahead and offer them an alcohol wipe. Let's switch gears now, moving to appendicitis, probably one of the more common causes of the acute abdomen that we see in the emergency department. And standard of care has traditionally been uh, an appendectomy. Um, now, about 10 years ago, uh, there was a lot of literature coming out of Europe that suggested, hey, you know what, maybe is appendicitis just a right-sided diverticulitis and should we be treating it with antibiotics instead? Um, and there were quite a few small studies. The biggest one was the APAC study that again was a European study uh, that showed initially that the uh, outcomes were, were very similar, whether you got antibiotics uh, or you got an appendectomy um, in, in uncomplicated appendicitis. Uh, but when they did the five-year follow-up, they realized that up to 39% needed an appendectomy eventually. So this was followed by a large American study. This was the CODA trial that was just published last year. And this involved 1,500 uh, patients. Um, and the bottom line here is they randomized them to two groups. The half of them got uh, you know, standard appendectomy and the other half got 24 hours of IV antibiotics followed by 10 days of oral antibiotics. Uh, and what they found was that antibiotics were not inferior to the appendectomy at 30 days. However, 20% needed an appendectomy at, at one month and 29% needed an appendectomy at three months. Uh, and patients who had an append appendicolith on imaging were more likely to fail the antibiotics. Now, this was, trial was stopped, or they published the results actually very early, only after three months, and it was because of, of COVID. Um, and they wanted to know if it was safe to actually to, you know, not operate on, on patients when, when our uh, hospitals were overburdened with COVID, and instead treat them with antibiotics. So, you know, at least this study showed that it was probably safe, but eventually, you know, a large proportion of them would need to have an appendectomy. So it's basically the timing of when you want to have your appendix out. Now, is this something that we should be doing as an eMERGE doc? I think that we should still be referring all these patients to general surgery. And this is a conversation that they can have with the general surgeon. Uh, and I'm sure they'll go over the sort of the risks and benefits of both. Uh, I mean, the risks being the usual stuff with surgery, you know, wound infection, uh, adhesion, post-op adhesions, you know, time off work versus antibiotics, you know, diarrhea, C. difficile, uh, resistance, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and it'll basically come down to uh, the patient choice. So here's a case, 44 year old male presents to the emergency department with right lower quadrant abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and fever. The uh, past medical history includes an appendectomy one year ago, but the patient says this feels exactly like my appendicitis last year and exam reveals severe tenderness in the right lower quadrant with peritoneal signs. And you do the CT and it shows, yeah, you guess it, stump appendicitis. So the um, reason I'm bringing this up is because we should, just because somebody had an appendectomy doesn't mean that they can't get appendicitis again. Uh, now, granted, this is extremely rare. It's one in 50,000 appendectomies. But if they have a good story and a good physical exam, uh, you probably should do a CT scan to make sure that you're not missing this. Um, and typically, the, 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 this is reported more in patients who've had a laparoscopic uh, appendectomy versus the traditional open appendectomy. Uh, 
So just be aware of this. Stump appendicitis. So here's a, uh, a study. Uh, this was a review of eight articles. Um, and basically, a lot of us just reflexively, whenever we give morphine or any opioid, we give an antiemetic with it. Um, and, they, and here they question this and say, should we be giving prophylactic uh, antiemetics to patients with opioids? Um, and, and the reason was there are side effects. So the, anytime you give an antiemetic, there's the, there's the possibility of sedation, the possibility of extrapyramidal side effects. And here they reviewed studies that basically included metoclopramide, um, ondansetron, and prochlorperazine. Um, and they found actually that there was no difference in the, uh, the amount of nausea and vomiting, whether you got the prophylactic antiemetics or you got placebo. Um, so they came out with a sort of grade A recommendation that we should not be giving uh, antiemetics to patients with opioids. Now, for me, this, this applies to somebody who's being given an opioid for pain. So, you know, you got somebody with a bad fracture and you're giving some morphine. You do not have to give, you know, an antiemetic here. Um, but... The other common scenario is when somebody comes in with severe abdominal pain and they're vomiting, uh, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't give the antiemetic there because if they're, if they're coming in with vomiting, you're not giving it prophylactically, you're giving it to actually treat the patient. So please go ahead and give it there. One problem with the studies, there were no studies that, that, that studied gravel and the gravel is probably the most common thing that I think most uh, uh, of us in the uh, Canadian emergency departments use when we give morphine. Uh, so maybe some room for a study there. So this is what eMERGE docs thinks of uh, radiology reports. Switch gears to diverticulitis, another sort of common condition that we see in the emergency department. Um, and there's been a sort of a, a paradigm shift in the way we think about this. Uh, diverticulitis maybe is more of an inflammatory disease than a, an infectious disease. And again, this is big in Europe where, you know what, they're not using antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis. And so the question is, should we in Canada be using antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis? Um, and what, first of all, we have to sort of define what, what does uncomplicated mean? So basically it's the very simple, you know, there's, there's no abscess, there's no perforation, uh, there's no pus leaking into your belly, there's no you know, feces uh, dripping into your belly. So just on, they basically just have an infected diverticulum. That's, that's what we mean by uncomplicated diverticulitis. Uh, and there've been many, many studies mainly from Europe um, that have shown that actually there is no difference between watching these patients and giving antibiotics. Um, and a lot of the guidelines in Europe actually, actually state that quite openly, you know, you should not be giving antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis. This really hasn't sort of filtered down to North America for some reason, despite the fact that the American Gastroenterological Association came out with this position paper and in 2015, where quote, it says antibiotic use for diverticulitis should be selective rather than routine. So where does that leave us here in the Canadian emergency departments? I think we should probably have a discussion with our gastroenterology colleagues and see if this is something that they maybe will come on board with. Um, I found it useful for patients that are actually don't want antibiotics. A lot of patients actually are afraid of, of developing resistance or of getting side effects such as C. difficile and actually are questioning whether we should be using antibiotics. So for those patients, I'll say yes, there's definitely evidence for not using antibiotics and just observing you um, and, and uh, as long as you have good follow-up. What about dietary restriction? Well, I was taught that anytime you have diverticulitis, you should put them on a sort of a clear you know, liquid diet for at least two or three days and slowly gradually increase the, uh, the solids. Well, that turns out actually to be uh, not true. Um, and there, again, a lot of studies mainly from Europe that's, that suggests you can use any diet you want. And that's basically an unrestricted, unrestricted diet, even uh, when they're having their episode of diverticulitis. Um, also, I was taught that we should, people with have di diverticular disease should not be eating nuts, corn, and popcorn. I know as the theory was that those, these things would get stuck in the diverticulum and cause diverticulitis. Again, a lot of evidence that shows that that is not true. And basically the only thing you should be telling these patients is after they get better, they should probably have a, have a lot of fiber in their diet just to prevent constipation. Who needs to be admitted? Basically anybody with complicated diverticulitis. So, um, if you look on the, on the right side, and if you have any of those sort of high risk patients, they should be admitted. So basically abscess, perforation, fistula, stricture, obstruction, they need to be admitted. And the criteria for discharge home um, uh, with or without, you see, is, I'm glad they actually put here with or without antibiotics are the mild cases. Uh, so uncomplicated, uh, you know, not much vomiting, not much pain, uh, can to tolerate oral feeds and, and, and uh, adequate follow-up. Is, patient, is uh, outpatient colonoscopy required? I was always told that anybody with diverticulitis needs an automatic colonoscopy to rule out colon cancer. 
Well, again, not much evidence around that, and actually evidence against. So the Europeans seem to, again, seem to say that no, uh, diverticulitis does not predispose you to colon cancer. Um, so you do not need routine colonoscopy after an event. Uh, and basically they're saying you should use, you, uh, recommend colonoscopy for patients that you would normally uh, recommend for screening colonoscopy. So, you know, patients over 50 years old or with a family history of colon cancer. So just having diverticulitis itself does not increase your risk of having colon cancer. So here's a study on glucagon um, and uh, whether it's effective um, on uh, foreign bodies. So esophageal foreign bodies or food impactions, which we actually commonly see in the emergency department. So actually this was a meta-analysis of five studies, uh, about 1,100 patients. Um, and unfortunately, they found that glucagon is not associated with improved treatment success. So basically, 30% of the glucagon patients and 33% of the placebo patients got better. Uh, so glucagon was no better than placebo. Uh, and you know what, I've used glucagon, um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't. Probably, yeah, I probably agree with the 30% here, but placebo was 30%. Um, so they're saying actually do not use this because not only does it not work, uh, but there's actually a higher rate of complications, specifically vomiting, retching, which could lead to, you know, theoretical aspiration risks and rupture risks. So I think this is probably the, uh, the end of glucagon for esophageal foreign bodies and food impactions. So to be fair, I think this is what radiology thinks of eMERGE docs. Uh, we uh, CT everything, although I disagree. So next case, 58 year old female presents with right upper quadrant pain that was initially intermittent, but has now been persistent for 24 hours. Her husband tells you that she looks yellow to him. Um, and here's your physical exam, febrile, tachycardic, scleral, icterus and jaundice, tender right upper quadrant with positive Murphy sign. So the question here becomes, what is the life-threatening diagnosis to consider here? So acute cholangitis, uh, and the reason I'm sort of bringing this up is that this actually is a, a, a you know a three alarm fire. You should be waking up your consultants for this. This cannot wait for a cholecystectomy, you know, in, in the next morning. So basically, what happens here is that you have a an obstruction in the common bile duct, and the bile sort of backs up, and you have increased pressure. The reason it's called ascending cholangitis is you have bacteria sitting here in the duodenum and it ascends up the common bile duct and then you get an infection. So now you have pus under pressure behind this obstruction. Um, and sort of classically, we're taught about Charcot's triad, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain and fever. And then if you add hypotension and confusion, you get Reynolds pentad. I mean, they're good if they have them. So they're specific, but they're not very sensitive. Uh, so just be aware of this diagnosis. Um, and again, the pathophysiology, and this, this looks complicated, but basically it's saying that you have some kind of biliary obstruction in the common bile duct, most, most commonly gallstones, but it could be a stricture or malignancy. Um, and that builds up sort of, you get, uh, you know, bile under pressure, you get the sort of ascending bacteria from the uh, duodenum, and then you have an infection there. And then this can translocate into your blood and you can get bacteremic and septic. So that's sort of the pathophysiology. This is a, an emergency, basically untreated. You have a 100% mortality rate. What's the treatment? Uh, wake up your consultant. Typically, this will be your gastroenterologist uh, and uh, IV fluids, IV antibiotics, and the definitive tre treatment is an ERCP. That's the sort of the standard of care these days. So they'll put a scope down um, and, uh, and try to manually retrieve the stone and unblock that common bile duct. And this is a nice uh, sort of summary slide on different clinical scenarios that you can have with a gallstone. So if it's basically just sits in your gallbladder, that's cholelithiasis. Uh, and if it sort of translates, gets stuck here in the cystic duct, you get biliary colic. Um, if it permanently gets stuck here, then you, then you can get cholecystitis. If it moves on down here, which, uh, and you get stuck here in the common bile duct, that's where you get cholelithiasis. And then if that gets infected, then you get cholangitis. And then if it sort of gets stuck down here, I think this is actually wrong here. I think this, sh this should be actually gallstone pancreatitis. So if it gets sort of stuck down here, what happens is your, your pancreatic enzymes can't come out and the bile and pancreatic enzymes sort of back up into the pancreas and cause pancreatitis. So there's quite a bit of, uh, quite, a things that, quite, a things, quite a lot of things that gallstones can cause, a lot of clinical scenarios.
if it's just biliary colic, so usually you know pain pain free after you're giving some 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 um, pain medication and some some antiemetics, um, and they're not febrile, they can go home with outpatient uh, follow up. Usually they'll need an outpatient lap coli. If they actually have acute cholecystitis, so they, so they have you know uh, pain that doesn't go away, they have fever, they have a white count, uh, they need to be admitted for to surgery. They get IV antibiotics, and then usually usually they'll get a lap coli within 24 hours. What about a calculus cholecystitis? Should you be worried? Yes. So this has a higher morbidity and mortality rate. Uh, so basically, these are your sick patients, typically in the ICU. They're dehydrated. They, you know, they're in shock. They're septic, um, and you basically get sort of thick sludge in the gallbladder. So you don't, you don't, you do not actually have a gallstone, but you just get sort of this. The uh, the bile gets turns into sludge and, and causes an obstruction and an infection. Um, and these patients have a high rate of perforation and gangrene. Uh, so these need to be, you know, aggressively treated with uh, resuscitation, antibiotics. Uh, and, and quick general surgery consult. Uh, same thing goes with emphysematous cholecystitis. Typically, these are uh, more elderly patients, diabetic, um, and they come in with a compromised uh, blood supply. So typically, the the artery, um, the cystic artery, will get compromised. So you get an anaerobic environment. Uh, therefore, you get anaerobic bacteria, gas forming, um, and this leads to increased uh, perforation and gangrenous rates for the gallbladder. So these patients need to go to the operating room soon, uh, and you should uh, uh, aggressively resuscitate them and, and treat them with IV antibiotics and fluids. So here you can see the gas forming. There's a lot of gas around the gallbladder. That's a bad sign. Uh, urgent surgical consult is definitely required here. What about gallstone ileus? What is this? So with recurrent episodes of cholecystitis, you get inflammation around your gallbladder. And if your duodenum is right next to, her, next to it, uh, you can actually sort of get the gallbladder gets stuck to the duodenum and a fistula de develops. And then gallstones can enter from the gallbladder directly into your small intestine. The most common place is the duodenum. Um, and as it goes down there, especially if the stones are big, you know, typically more than two or 2.5 centimeters, they can actually cause a mechanical obstruction. So gallstone ileus is a misnomer because uh, it's not really an ileus. There's actually a mechanical obstruction. And the triad here is the Wrigler's triad. So pneumobilia, so it's air in the biliary tract, uh, a radiolucent gallstone, and a small bowel obstruction. Uh, this needs a pretty urgent surgical referral. So they'll actually go in uh, a laparotomy and they'll make an enterolithotomy. So they'll cut into the, into the bowel pull out the stone, uh, repair the fistula, and most of the times they'll take the gallbladder at the same time. You'll get a cholecystectomy at the same time. And here is a nice image here up at the top. That's actually the gallstone in blocking the lumen of the uh, small intestine, and there it is being pulled out. So that's a pretty large gallstone there. So this... This was a sort of for me. Was this was a disappointing uh, result here? I love TXA. I'm sure most emerge docs love TXA, just like we like ketamine and mag sulfate. We can use it for many, many things. Um, so the initial study. So if you look, March 2021. So just a month ago, uh, in the annals, uh, they published this sort of meta analysis of a whole bunch of studies on the effects, efficacy of transoxemic acid on upper GI bleeds. And they initially found so they were they used 10 randomized trials with 2,000 patients and concluded that yes, TXA has a lower mortality rate uh, and uh, no change in thromboembolic risk. But if you look at the take home message here, they said, however, a recent large trial did not demonstrate benefit in this patient population, which unfortunately was this halted trial. And the trouble, not the trouble, but this trial was huge. It had 12,000 patients uh, versus the 2000 in the sort of the meta analysis on the left. And unfortunately, I mean, for us, it found that it, there was no difference in, uh, in, in GI bleeding with TXA. And not only that, uh, they actually found a small increase in, in, in thrombobolic risk. So they actually found 0.8% versus 0.4% uh, with placebo uh, risk of thrombosis, specifically DBT or PE. Which for me doesn't really make sense because TXA is not uh, a, a procoagulant. It's an antifibrinolytic. And most Prior studies actually show no increased risk of thrombosis, uh, but they did find it here. So we need more study. So unfortunately, this sort of is uh, sort of a you know a yellow light telling us you know back off a little bit. Uh, trans TXA is not uh, a, a treatment for everything. Okay, another case: 32-year-old female, uh, 34 weeks gestation, presents the emerge with nausea, vomiting, anorexia, uh, and right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. So the question is, what are the two potential life-threatening conditions to be considered? 
case. So I think most of us will not, will always think about preeclampsia, specifically the help for a variant. So the hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and the platelets, which has a high mortality. Uh, but the one condition that most of us, including myself, didn't know until I gave this, until I sort of put this to talk together, is a condition called acute fatty liver of pregnancy, which actually has a higher mortality rate than help. So typically this condition is seen in the third trimester, you know, between 30 and 38 weeks. Um, and there's a problem with fatty acid metabolism, both in the fetus and in the mother. So it's, it's, there's a genetic predisposition and basically fat accumulates in the hepatocytes leading to um, hepatic failure uh, with, you know, severe consequences, including coagulopathy, encephalopathy, uh, renal failure, coma, and death. So this uh, needs to be identified and referred urgently to ob -GYN. These are the official criteria. They're called the Swansea diagnostic criteria. So the more of you, if you have six or more of these, you definitely meet the criteria for AFLP. Um, and the definitive treatment is delivery, get the baby out, supportive care. Uh, so this is an urgent OB consult. So just keep this in, uh, in your differential for uh, abdo pain or jaundice in, in pregnant patients. Okay. Moving along, this is another one of these nice little studies here. Topical capsation for the treatment for cannabinoid hyperemesis, a systemic review and meta-analysis. Um, so this is another one of these why not pa papers. As we say, we're seeing a lot of cannabinoid hyperemesis with the legalization of, of uh, marijuana um, in Canada. And a lot of these patients, unfortunately, will develop this sort of chronic hyperemesis syndrome. Um, and uh, you know what? Uh, Haloperidol works really well for these patients, for sure. But sometimes these patients are stuck out in triage. Again, with, you know, everything's backed up. There's no IV. Um, what can you do? Well, often these patients will come in with their friends. And so what you do is you get your, their buddy to go to the, uh, the pharmacy in the, in the hospital and get them to buy some of this capsaicin cream. And basically, they just rub it on their belly. Um, and, and it actually showed, uh, this meta-analysis showed that there is, it was actually quite effective. Uh, with, with basically no side effects. Um, so something for us to consider in our armamentarium for um, hyper uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And it's thought to work the same way as hot showers work for these patients. It activates uh, this receptor uh, called a TRPV1 uh, associated with heat um, that actually helps with uh, the nausea and the vomiting. Quick update on bowel obstruction. Another common thing that we see in the emergency department. So what's the imaging of choice? Um, I'll tell you that x-rays are pretty much out, not very sensitive, not very specific, doesn't really tell you where the lead point is. So pretty much what you can, you know, stop doing x-rays, you should be going probably straight to CT. Now, POCUS, uh, uh, bedside ultrasound, there's a lot of evidence that shows that, you know, at, with, with some training, definitely emerge dogs can pick up bowel obstructions with, with this. Um, so for, for those of you that are very sort of facile with ultrasound, this is definitely uh, cutting edge and will probably be, be useful in the emergency department. Uh, for us older people who are, you know, I mean, who are not as great with ultrasound, um, CT is definitely the sort of the treatment of choice. Most surgeons will want a CT because it, it not only tells them that if there is a bowel obstruction, but it'll also tell them where the lead point is and what kind of bowel obstruction it is. Now, the other question is, do you need IV or oral contrast? A lot of times, you know, the surgeons will say, yeah, give them oral contrast. There actually is no evidence. And actually there's evidence of harm with oral contrast, including nausea, vomiting, and aspiration. Um, and most studies have shown that actually there's no difference uh, in, uh, in picking up these, these bowel obstructions. So do not, you do not have to give oral contrast. IV contrast, it's nice to have. It can pick up edema and ischemia. Uh, but if there's a contraindication, um, you can um, um, most bowel obstructions can be picked up with a plain CT with neither oral or IV contrast. What about an NG tube? Uh, so do you, does everybody does everybody with, an, with a bowel obstruction need an, uh, an NG tube? Well, if, if you're a surgical resident, most of the first question they ask you when you refer them is, right, have you put in an NG tube? Um, and there's lots of evidence that says that, you know what, From you do not have to give it in, in all patients. Now, if the patient is vomiting constantly and has you know severe abdominal distension, yes, that will make them feel better. Uh, but if you know if they're you know, vomited twice during this whole episode and they're not distended, uh, there is evidence that you do not have to put an NG tube. And if anything, sometimes if you do put NG tubes in these patients, they actually uh, uh, it increases their length of stay. It can they can cause aspiration, pneumonia, respiratory failure. So there are downsides to this. So basically, only put an NG tube in if for severe uh, nausea, vomiting, and distension. <laughs> 
And then the last paper here is uh, another uh, a quickie. This is on Danzatron prescription associated with a reduced return visits to the pediatric emergency department for page, for children with gastroenteritis. And basically, what what they did this this was a sort of a retrospective study of eighty two thousand patients. Um, and they try to look at whether if, if, if they were given a prescription for ondansetron, whether it decreased 72 hour return visits. And they found that it did. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't huge. So, uh, without the prescription, the 5% return within 72 hours with the prescription, 4.2% re returned. Um, uh, I mean, there's really not much downside here. And also the other important thing is they didn't mask any alternate diagnosis. I think a lot of us were, were told not to give ondansetron prescriptions. Um, in case, you know, it masks something bad. Uh, so this study showed that actually it didn't, and it was probably safe to give a three-day prescription for uh, on Danzatron. Okay, so in summary, these are sort of the, the six quick articles that I think will uh, change your practice a little bit. Or uh, First one, isopropyl alcohol wipes for nausea triage, very easy to do. Second, no need for anti-emetics to begin with IV narcotics, just for pain. Three, glucagon is not effective for esophageal foreign bodies uh, and, or food impactions and can actually harm. Four, there's new evidence against TXA and upper GI bleeds, unfortunately. Five, consider ondansetron prescription for gastroenteritis. Uh, and six is definitely use topical capsation for your, your, your cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And then for appendicitis, antibiotics are an option, um, but just know in, uh, that 29% will need an appendectomy at three months and 39% will need it at five years and also be aware of stump appendicitis. Uh, in diverticulitis, consider withholding antibiotics for uncomplicated and uh, diverticulitis. There are really no dietary restrictions. Uh, and colonoscopy is per usual guidelines. You do not have to do a colonoscopy for every patient with diverticulitis, for uncomplicated diverticulitis. Gallbladder disease, consider cholangitis, acalculus, and emphysematous cholecystitis. These are all uh, killer diseases and should have urgent surgical or gastroenterological um, uh, referrals and consider uh, AFLP in your pregnant uh, patient that comes in with abdo pain or jaundice. And finally, small bowel obstruction. You do not have to give oral contrast. Polkus is definitely coming for this. Uh, and you do not have to get, put an NG tube in if it's, uh, excuse me, if it's mild symptoms. Okay. Um, I hope you all found this uh, useful. Um, and uh, thanks for your attention. Hopefully next year, can see you live and in person. Thanks, thank you very much.